All right, we are going to get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we have a really exciting conversation to have uh, today with, um, I will just admit it, even, even if we are being recorded, two of my favorite people to speak to. So, so glad that you can join us. And as you can see um, from the image on this opening slide right here, um, this is meant to be a conversation um, about a topic that can be really challenging. So there are no silly questions. And um, so feel free to, whether it's through the chat or um, in other ways to kind of share your perspectives. And we will have a couple of different opportunities to do that throughout our session today. So um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, of course, we want to cover some of the logistics. Um, there will be three brief um, presentations um, and we will be having a discussion amongst the three of us. Um, and this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few weeks. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can send them via the chat box. Um, uh, and you can do that either to the whole group or directly to Brianne Miller, um, who will then um, work with us to get those questions on board. So let's make it casual, engaging, and comfortable, uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> we know that we want this to be, um, this is not the beginning nor the end of a discussion around the racial disparities that we see in genetics, um, whether that's on the research side or on the services side. Um, we are trying to answer some of the hard questions about both why these disparities exist, and you could even say still exist, and um, really wanting to see um, how we can move the dialogue forward so that we can have real change. Um, we also are hearing stories from experts about the impact of racial disparities, um, and that's what the um, kind of opening part of our session today will be about. Um, and then discussing with our panelists and with each other, um, not just what the issues are, but really about what are the strategies to address these disparities. And, and you know, I think we can all come into the discussion with different perspectives of what disparities are. We have the disparities that are really data driven or that we can see from data, but then there are disparities that are a little bit harder to put our finger on in terms of just how people feel that they can or cannot engage in, in the healthcare system and in the research system. So when we are talking about disparities, we're really talking about all of that. Um, but yeah, we can move on. So, um, you know, why this discussion now? Um, of course, we know that we are um, in the middle of Black History Month, and I think there has been a lot leading in particular to this month from the past year, um, both with, um, you know, different marches around um, social justice issues and uh, race relation issues, um, but also, you know, really thinking about that there have been a number of initiatives that have been looking at whether you are talking about disparities or underrepresented um, communities in research, in genetics, in genetic services. Um, and at the same time, later this month, we will be looking at Rare Disease Awareness and Rare Disease Week. And so we just thought it was a really good time to think about, um, for many of us, these are not separate issues, but they are not just in our work overlapping, but in our lives overlapping, and really just having a uh, broad discussion about, well, what does that really look like? So our panelists today, there's me, that's fine. Um, but what we're really excited to hear from our, um, from is Shinika Collier and um, Elisa Ware. You know, these are two people who have really done the work, um, as they say, in terms of really looking at these issues and really uh, working with families and with communities to say, well, what is it that, what is the change that really needs to happen here? And, and I'm really excited to, for them both to be able to share some of their perspectives Perspectives and what they've learned from um, different communities across the country and as well as, um, you know, what they're seeing day to day in, in the work that they are doing. 
So uh, we will kick off today with um, this um, introduction and audience poll, just to get a sense of who is in the room. Then we will be setting the context for our discussion and our panelists' presentations. And these will be um, pretty casual, you know, um, you know, there's be some slides, but really just kind of setting the stage for our discussion. And then we will start to talk and to be looking at both the root causes, um, as well as different personal experiences. You know, what is it, what has witnessed Seeing the impacts of disparities been like in, in the work that we all do, um, the intersections of identity, and then looking ahead. And we will wrap up with another audience poll. Um, these polls are both to get you all thinking, but also for us to be able to see what we want to do in the future in terms of um, either sessions like this and other types of opportunities that we can provide for more community dialogue. So as you said, this is a casual conversation about challenges. We see many of us have our coffees or teas. Um, so we really want people not to be afraid to ask questions or to chime in and to use either the raise hand button um, and share in the chat box. Um, we'll see how the conversation goes and to see how we can pull in the themes that are coming in through, um, through the audience. Um, this is a judgment-free space. I think that's really important um, to say as we are all learning um, and all are starting at different points. Um, and if you have any technical issues or really, you know, anything at all, um, please reach out to Brianne Miller in the chat box, as we've already said, and she will know how to triage and, and get you what you need. So we will be launching our first poll just to hear a little bit about yourselves um, and um, so that we have a sense of how we can gauge our discussion um, between the panelists. Um, so we have this first poll that's going up and just to see what category you belong to and how you most identify yourself with. We know many people wear many different hats and could probably feel, say, oh, I feel like I'm three out of these, um, but just the one that you're, you're feeling most closely identified with um, during this session. Getting some. some answers coming in, and so we will uh, give this a couple minutes, but it's always fun to see the bar go back and forth. So we'll give it about another 10 or so seconds to get your vote in. All right. So I'm going to, there we go. So we have um, about a third of healthcare providers um, and then the rest kind of sprinkled out through students, professors, industry representatives, parents, um, advocacy organizations, so, um, and researchers. So I think this is a nice range of perspectives to, to bring. So we will jump into our discussion and really talking about, you know, setting the stage for the context of our discussion and really looking at what disparities are we seeing in genetics and genomics um, landscape. And so with that, we will um, move forward and go to the Next slide. So, as I said, the way we're defining some of these issues is the genetic service from a genetic services perspective is really any service that's provided to an individual to assess risk for diagnose and to treat genetic disorders. Um, and then disparities in those services are really preventable differences in the knowledge about the distribution of and the access to genetic services. Um, and these are adopted from the CDC. And though a lot of our work at Expecting Health really focuses around genetic services and connecting people to services, we know that that is one slice of a pipeline and a major part of that pipeline is research. And the fact that we really need to learn as we go along and to be able to see, you know, learn what communities need, what their perspectives are, and uh, what are the services they are or are not getting to be able to improve, um, you know, down the line when we really get into that clinical space. Next slide. 
So disparities in access to genetic services. You know, we know that Black patients are less likely to know about the availability of genetic testing. Um, we also know that they are less likely to see the benefits of genetic testing and also less likely to have insurance that covers these services. So, I mean, this data right here shows why we're having this discussion. Um, and that for each of these points here, it isn't just one piece, but there are multiple factors that lead into um, why we are seeing these, um, these disparities. So when thinking about the role of healthcare providers, um, we know that physicians serving Black patients are less likely to um, have the specialized um, healthcare experiences in genetics. We also know that there's this overall lack of diversity in genetic service providers, and you could say that's the case you know, across healthcare, but obviously today we're talking about genetics and genomics. And also we know that physicians serving by patients are less likely to refer their patients to genetic services. And there are, um, I feel like this whole thing, this, these points here could be a whole course in and of themselves, but it's important for us to know where we are starting off from. Um, and particularly from the perspective of, you know, the role of healthcare providers. We know they are one part of a broader system, of course, um, but we also know that people um, really are looking to have trusted, good relationships with their healthcare providers. So um, hence why we are kind of laying the stage with this information. Next, please. So we know that there have been the historic abuses of Black patients and their data in the healthcare system um, that has led to mistrust. Um, I will add on to that too, that um, we know that this is still going on in different components. So um, when we say historic, I, I don't want that to be seen as like, oh, a long, long time ago, but really a pattern of um, these abuses and that have led to mistrust that lead us to, um, you know, to today. Um, that there's a lack of diversity in genetic uh, research data, which um, Shaniqua will discuss a bit, um, and also the risk for further discrimination around, against Black patients based on genetic data. So um, we know that um, it is a very slippery and um, steep slope, I guess you could say, in terms of saying um, we are seeing this in Black patients based on their genetic data. It's, it can be a very short leap to that means we can assume this about all Black patients or all Black communities. Um, and, and we have to be really careful about that to make sure that our data that we're using um, and that we're gathering is being gathered in a way that it can be helpful and beneficial, not just um, a new way of, of labeling a group of people, whether that being um, Black patients particularly, but really any, any group. Next slide. So our role in this conversation uh, for Expecting Health, you know, our vision is that we really believe that any new and expectant family, regardless of makeup, income, or background, should and deserves to expect health and be able to define what health and being healthy means for them. We have a number of programs that are really uh, lend themselves to this. So we have our National Genetics Education and Family Support Center, which is focused on connecting families to genetic services. Um, and we also have one of our Keystone programs, Babies First Test, looking at newborn screening, which though every baby is offered and provided newborn screening, um, and that is can be seen as very equitable, um, the treatment and services that come along after that um, are, are not always as equitable for a range of different reasons. So we look at that from, from that perspective in that program. Next, please. So those are just our references that you'll share and we'll be able to look back to um, once this is posted. But um, I'm really excited to delve into a little bit more of the data and, and what disparities in genetic research is looking like and how that leads to genetic services. Um, and so I'm happy to pass this baton on to um, Shiniba Collier. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation with everyone. I have just a few slides that provide an overview of my perspective on how disparities in genetics research lead to disparities in genetics services. 
So I'm coming, I'm approaching this with a bioethics lens. I'm not a geneticist. My training is in law. My research area is called ELSI. That stands for the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about the implications of genomics research and also bioethics questions and uh, justice questions. And so we know that justice is an important bioethics principle, just like others, just like informed consent or autonomy, respect for persons. We also know that there are concerns about eugenics that Natasha alluded to earlier when she talked about the potential to misuse and abuse genetic information. What I'm going to talk about though, and what I'm looking forward to discussing with you is inclusion, diversity and inclusion in research and um, recruitment and enrollment, but also going beyond that. So um, the bioethicist Patricia King has said that justice may require more than securing greater inclusion of women, minorities, and other groups in research to derive the benefits from research. And I hope to touch on that a little bit today. So we need inclusion, but we also need more. So there are two issues that I want to discuss. Um, let's hit the next button diversity and inclusion on all levels, and refining our analyses of diverse populations. So next, let's look at issue one. Here's an article I co-authored with, with two geneticists that both work at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And we highlighted why the progress in terms of diversity and inclusion in genomics research has been so slow and uneven. We could talk later about some of the progress that we're seeing now, but, but what, why are we at this point where diversity and inclusion is so difficult? And some of the key issues that we discussed were just lagging diversity within the scientific community. Um, scientists from low resource settings, minority backgrounds, and diverse ethnic groups are underrepresented. And we not only lose um, the individual perspective, but we lose hypotheses and we lose group and community perspectives. There's limited engagement. Um, if we emphasize only recruitment, what happens later on? Precision medicine is something we might talk about, and precision medicine requires long-term engagement with research particip participants. So we can't just recruit people. We also have to continue to work with them and keep them enthusiastic about the research. And, and I'm in favor of genomics research. I would love to live in a community where, where all of us are engaged in genetics, in genetics learning, knowledge, and research. There's a preferred cohort effect, um, long-term interest. There's a long, there has been a long-term interest by researchers in populations that are predominantly European or populations that are in Europe or white populations here in the United States. And, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of the reasons could simply be comfort with a certain population or proximity, being at a university that's near and close to a certain population. But the challenge is over time, as we continue to um, engage in research and collect samples and data from the same populations, those, um, those databases become the standard to which everything else is compared. They become the canon. And so we end up in a situation where we have flawed comparisons at a time when we want to increase diversity and inclusion. And a research, researcher, for example, studies a, an African-American population in the Southwest of America, and they want to publish research about genetics and diabetes. The editors of the journal might say, well, you only have 100 people. Why don't you have 5,000 people like um, the diabetes study that was conducted on people from Iceland? And we just don't have those numbers yet, but there is merit in engaging in those kinds of studies. So these kinds of comparisons are flawed and they slow progress. A lot of the technology that's developed, the chips that scan um, a person's genome, for example, might be tailored to a European population. And so while I will discuss briefly racial categories and ethnic categories and ancestral discussions about continental ancestry, while that is all very complicated, um, one thing is true. We need to have populations of diverse backgrounds that represent global human genomic diversity in research, and we need to have the tools that can be used to measure genetics and test for genetics in diverse populations, because some genetic variants are more frequent in some populations than others. 
Finally, there are analytical challenges. Once we begin to look at a large sample, if there is a lot of diversity in the sample, the scientists may try to make it more homogeneous by looking at only a, a European ancestry group that has limited genetic diversity. So these are some of the issues we have to grapple with. Next slide. Another challenge, and I also think this is an ethical issue, is that researchers sometimes discard data from minority populations. And the reasons I just highlighted, for example, data from different populations may cause what researchers call noise in the sample. So it's harder for them to see correlations because um, it's difficult to measure and interpret all of the different genetic variations that they're seeing in a diverse sample. These are reasons why researchers may discard data. But the article reports research finding that out of 58 studies the authors of, uh, examined, 45 of those studies just discarded data from underrepresented populations. And they argued, and I agree, that to discard data by default is, an, is ethically problematic. And so we need more incentives, processes, to encourage people to find ways to study data from diverse populations. Next slide, uh, clinical implications. And um, let's click next on this, great. Um, so what are the implications of a lack of diversity in research and a lack of diversity and inclusion? We will have more variants that we don't understand. I mentioned earlier that there is global genomic diversity. And as we move across the globe, we see different uh, variations appear in gradations as we move from one continent to another. And there's also diversity within the different continents. And so if we have a data set, and in this case, the data relates to BRCA1 and 2 mutations, this was a figure that was published on the internet reflecting the variance of unknown significance that Myriad Genetics came across during the days when it had a patent on genetic testing for BRCA mutations. And so around 2002, there were more variants of unknown significance in populations that came that had ancestry from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. But over time, as Myriad continued to collect genomic data and also study clinical data, they were able to better interpret those variants and uh, understand what those variants meant. And so as a result of building a diverse database by observing patients over time, Myriad Genetics was able to report the meaning of the genetic mutations to patients instead of saying, you know, I see something here that I've never seen before. I'm not sure what it means, which happens disproportionately to underrepresented minorities. A challenge here too is that Myriad's data is proprietary. So even when uh, they lost the Supreme Court case and lost the patent, the patent on genomic sequencing, this was, they were, Myriad, remained at the time was at the time one of the few labs that could interpret diverse data. And so the commercial aspects of genetic data sharing and databases also can pose challenges to um, addressing health disparities and genetic services. Next slide. All right. And so here are other articles that point to the fact that if the data that we're examining is does not represent diverse populations, then the risk estimates for diseases can be misestimated, misstated, can be incorrect. The first New York Times article reports a New England Journal of Medicine study on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in this study, researchers at Harvard found that African-American patients were more likely to be misdiagnosed for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because African-Americans were not included as controls in the clinical trials um, examining the, clin the genetic basis of this disease. The authors Landry and colleagues also explain that lack of diversity in genomic databases means that in the clinic, 
physicians will feel more comfortable offering a genetic test to someone who identifies as white and has European ancestry than they will offering a genetic test to someone of a diverse background because of the lack of information, returning to that concept of variance of unknown significance. So next slide, issue two. How do we talk about populations? Many of you who are in the field of genetics have seen this slide. It's, it's presented often. The researchers um, uh, who published this data in 2016 um, conducted a study building on data that was reported in 2009. In 2009, 96% of participants in a type of study that locates, that helps researchers understand correlations between genes and disease, it's very important uh, to engage in genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. 96% of GWAS studies that identified these correlations were conducted on patients with European ancestry. In 2016, Popejoy and Fullerton looked at the data and found that we're now at 81%. The greatest increase is among people who um, are described as having Asian ancestry. But in terms of African-Americans, uh, Latino, Latinx um, individuals, Native Americans, under 4% were included in these studies in 2016. We're working on rectifying that now. Another issue, um, uh, the point of this slide really, is to talk about how those populations are described. And I think it's, it's meaningful that um, in most cases when examining genetic samples from Sub-Saharan Africa, those samples were labeled as Black or Sub-Saharan Africa, African. However, when talking about samples of, of European origin, those samples were described in more geographically specific and informative terms. Next slide, please. So um, what ends up happening is we use what are called superpopulation categories to describe groups of people. And to, and sometimes researchers compare groups of people using umbrella categories like Black or African. And if we're not careful, all of the discussion that researchers are, not having, are now having about the importance of ancestry and understanding how diverse ancestry, even in one individual. One individual can have ancestry. Obviously, we all know this from diverse places. We could end up conflating the promise of ancestry with racial categories, conflating ancestry and race. And this was a really, this is a really informative study because researchers found originally that HLA mutations that cause patients to have an adverse reaction to a Bacavir. In some cases, it could lead to death. Um, they found these mutations were prevalent in European ancestry populations, and the FDA recommended screening of all people who identify as, have, as being European Americans or white Americans. Uh, later on, research, researchers went back and looked at the data and found that Indians from um, Southwest America, Gujarati Indians in particular, had this variant at the highest level and rate. And when they looked at the data and saw how much diversity there is in, in terms of how this variant expresses in different um, ethnic groups in different geographic locations, uh, FDA now uh, recommends screening for everyone. But another data point I want you to look at is how the frequencies change if, if the person is from Luya, Kenya versus Maasai, Kenya, or from Kenya versus Yoruba in Nigeria. In both cases, in all three cases, all of those individuals will, would be described as having African ancestry or would be described as Black. And so um, moving forward in terms of making genetic services more accessible will also mean going beyond race and ethnic categories to use other factors such as genetic ancestry information to discuss risk. Just a few more slides. Now, even if race did matter, even if race were not just a biological, uh, I'm sorry, just a social construct, we are having trouble talking about race. <laughs> and um, these articles, and if you click next, I think a few more will appear. Yes, 
all of these articles, and there are many more, talk about the inconsistent reporting of race, genetics, and ancestry in medical journals. And um, let me wrap up. My, my computer's dying. I'm going to have to plug it in. Two more slides. The next slide. Um, this article by Bonham and Green just published talks about building a diverse genomics workforce and steps we can take to build our pipeline. And, the, and uh, we can talk more about that. And then my last slide is just a summary of the challenges that I described that we can work on overcoming. And I'm going to stop there and, and look for my plug so that you don't lose me. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that um, really important overview and really highlighting um, the data points um, where they have been, where they still are. Um, and I think that leads us really nicely into our next session um, with Elisa. So please take it away. Sure, um, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm Elisa Ware. I am um, a program manager at Family Voices. Um, so next slide. Um, so this is me and my daughter and my husband, um, and so I wanted to just take a moment to talk about um, kind of our journey through genetics, and, and we, didn't, we didn't land at a geneticist until my daughter was 14, she's 18 now, um, and with all of the, the myriad of, of both family history um, on both sides of our family with genetic conditions as well as challenges that she was having, the journey was long and it was quite difficult um, in, in being able to access um, genetic services. Um, we, e even with the family history, um, there, there, just, there never was a referral until we really started to push. I started to learn about you know, genetics and, and really started asking the questions of providers about, you know, well, what about this? Well, what about this family history? Well, you know, my, my uncle had this or my grandmother had that. Um, and, and really looking at how all of, what all of that meant with the symptoms that she was having and understanding um, kind of what her genetic profile was and, and any diagnoses um, that could follow. I'll tell you that once we got there, I found myself a bit underwhelmed because we ended up exactly as um, Shanique was shared with, variants of, you know, unknown origin. They really couldn't understand while she, they recognized that she had some genetic anomalies um, that also after further study existed in my husband as well um, that he never knew um, about, but they have very similar presentations and um, with some things and they still couldn't give us answers. And they said, come back in a few years. We'll see what, you know, what, what comes up, how, you know, if we're able to collect further samples, if we're able to figure out some things, maybe we'll know more. Um, and so my story is not my story alone. Um, as I work with families at Family Voices um, and in other work that I've done, you know, these stories are, are fairly common. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about how, how we get there and what are the challenges that families really face. So next slide, please. So first, you can't really get to talking about challenges with uh, genomic and genetic services and access to it without really understanding the challenges of accessing medical services as a whole. And I think Natasha touched on a few of these. Um, racism is a, a, a major part of it, and I think that it's often what we shy away from and why we're here having this challenging conversation today, because, you know, implicit bias and the way that, you know, um, uh, providers uh, engage with families um, and, and you see the medical system engage with families can really create barriers to being able to access needed medical services overall. And, and um, we'll get to really how that impacts um, accessing genetic services in a minute. Um, again, as Natasha mentioned, the lack of trust due to these kind of historical actions that we've seen um, really impact families willingness um, to go forward um, and, and talk about um, genetics as a whole, to engage in genetic services, to seek out those services, because what is it that they want to know? And ultimately, what are they going to do with the information that they receive? Um, and, and we hear that a lot in the Black community as well as when we talk to um, uh, 
um, people that live in the Navajo, the Navajo Nation, for example, or when we talk to uh, Latinx families, we um, we know that uh, they, they there's a concern about if I give this information, if I if if I participate in this genetic study, or if I participate in um, in genetic testing, then what happens? Um, and and so that can be quite challenging. Um, Residing in areas with limited access to quality and adequate medical services, I think, is a huge one. Um, and, and I'm going to dig a little more deeper when we talk about genetic services, but we know that this is an issue with medical services overall. Um, and finally, lower quality of services for medical providers. So, you know, um, the, the services that Black families receive um, can often uh, be, you know, limited partnership, uh, limited conversation, I'm really kind of feeling as if kind of it's like a check box and you're kind of being moved through and pushed through really quickly to, you know, okay, fine, we, we saw you, oh, those are the concerns you have, okay, we'll talk about it the next time. Um, and so we see kind of some lower quality services um, from medical providers when we talk about the services that Black families receive. Next slide, please. So when we talk about genetic and genomic services, what, what I've heard from families, what I've seen, you know, with myself is that there's really a mystery when it comes to genetic services. How does this work? Where does my information go? I don't really understand what they're searching for. Um, and, and consequently, it leaves families questioning what's available to me. How is this, how are these services going to be uh, received? Who's going to pay for them, which I don't even have listed on the slide? Who provides the services? Um, and ultimately, what ends up happening is that a lot of these services and geneticists really rest in major institutions that often aren't close to um, Black communities where they're able to access it or they, they have challenges with being able to afford it. And I, you know, I think about my own, you know, my own situation where we, we had gone through, we did the testing and she said, you know, so insurance isn't going to cover this. So it's about, you know, $2,000 for this testing. They have this program you could apply for, we'll see, you know, which this is what I do for a living. I have a lot of experience in this. I'm going to go through the paperwork. I'm going to go through the process, but that can be an absolute barrier for many families. And, and they say, wait, I can't, you know, I can't afford that. Um, I can't, uh, um, I, 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 I can't engage in this because I don't really understand. And I don't know how um, I, I would be able to afford this and, and, and what happens afterwards. And I think the other part is, as in my story, what happens afterwards? Where do we go with this information? You know, for my daughter, it was, you know, it was an unknown origin. They, we still really don't have an understanding of some of the, the challenges that she has and some of the things that came out in her genetic testing. Um, and so then, then what do you do and where do you go from there? And, and that often isn't clear for families either. Um, so next slide, please. So what are the consequences um, for adverse families? And, and this is where on, on my end, where I often see families coming in to have conversations both with you know, myself as well as colleagues um, and individuals and you know, family and family health information centers or other entities across the country, um, is that they're really talking about this extensive diagnostic odyssey, this timing of, you know, I've been trying to figure out what's going on for years and years and I still have no answers. And when you're left with no answers, kind of what does what what happens with that? Um, one, it's a it, you're going to have increased financial burden, right? You're going to have you know you spend all of this time and all of this money. Sometimes there's there's foregone income because you're just trying to figure out what is it that's happening. Um, how 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 do I help my child um, get what they need um, or my family member get what they need? Um, and consequently that can, you know, have a major financial burden on families. Um, also having poor health outcomes for their children, especially when we're talking about genetics and genomics in children, which is primarily um, the, the area that I work in, um, that there, there can be poor outcomes because often either the testing doesn't happen, so it's foregone, um, uh, medical care or um, there's increased stress in the family because they just really don't understand what's happening, how to help their child, what, you know, what the, the, the challenges are. And, and that has a, 
an impact not only on the child's health, but on the family's health overall. Um, and so we see this increased stress in Black families, um, and we can see it, you know, especially when there are genetic conditions that exist, as well as financial burden. And so because of that, it's imperative that we figure out, you know, how to address these disparities and increase knowledge and education, um, which we'll talk more about later, um, and, and, and really get to solutions of addressing um, the disparities that exist um, for, for Black families and accessing genetic um, services. So with that, I'll end there um, so that we can start in our, our conversation. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much uh, for uh, both sharing your uh, specific story and experiences, as well as the work that you have um, encountered and what you've heard from other families through your role at Family Voices. I think it's a really nice combination between the data points that Shaniqua was sharing from a research perspective and then the um, not that research isn't real life, but you know, and then what does it mean when it's out in practice um, and, and the encounters that families are having. So we have a lot of questions that have come in, which is great, um, and also some questions that we've had to help shape the discussion. So I will uh, do my best to uh, intertwine the two. Uh, but you know, one thing that I really wanted to um, help kick off our discussion is to really kind of come back to um, Again, you know, even though this is a casual conversation about talking about some things that are uncomfortable, um, coming back to the concept and the realities of racism and racism at all levels and how that's contributed to the development and maybe in even the persistence of these disparities that we're seeing. Um, and so, and even though I may um, uh, address these questions to um, one person or another, um, it, you know, it's really up to the entire panel to 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 chime in, um, but you know, for you know, Shaniqua, you know, you talked about um, you know racism and and really the need for you know, I guess you could say racism. And another side of that is just the need for more diverse um, data um, within genetic research. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about you know this isn't something that's new, this isn't something that has just been talked about for the past five years or even the past 10 years, um, you know, but why are we still at this point? Um, and I thought that example that you mentioned in terms of the discarding of data because it's noise um, and just how, um, you, you know, you can look at that from a data perspective, but also just a societal perspective. What does it mean when the experiences of a whole group are deemed as noise? And then we ask, why don't we know more about it? Um, it there's a clear link there. So I was just hoping if you could just speak a bit more to that, you know, either why we're still at this place um, today or and or, you know, where are we going and are, are we really turning a curve? Sure. You know, it's very interesting, and I could think of so many things to say about it. One, the first that comes to mind is that pharmaceutical companies and researchers want to invest in a market that's going to purchase their services, right? So if we look at pharmacogenomics, pharmacogenomics um, investigates genetic variations and drug response. Um, who will be the market that can purchase? WHO, the World Health Organization, published um, a report many years ago saying that our investment uh, in research is in 10% of the world's diseases that cover 10% of the burden of our population and 90% of the diseases um, and conditions that require research are neglected. Um, so that's one issue. Where are we putting our research dollars? Who are we choosing to fund? What questions are we choosing to fund? Um, NIH published a report finding that the kinds of questions that underrepresented minorities are interested in asking are less likely to get funded. Those are questions about health disparities, social influences on health. They're less likely to get NIH dollars. Another final point I want to talk about is trustworthiness. We often want to blame underrepresented minorities who have a legitimate concern about past research abuses for not participating in research. But there should be opportunity, incentives, and um, frameworks 
so that we can begin to put, put the burden on institutions and researchers to be trustworthy to these communities. A person's experience in medicine, all of the details that Elisa so eloquently described, many have reported are inextricably linked with their desire to participate in research. So as long as we have these kinds of disparities, as long as people don't view institutions as trustworthy, we can expect that there are going to be these kinds of disparities. Thank you for that. And I, I think it really parallels the conversation and uh, talking points, if you will, that we're hearing around um, COVID testing and COVID um, vaccinations in terms of, you know, I think you now we turn on the TV and we see, you know, why are Black communities not getting the vaccine? And it's being like, is that even the way we should be framing that question? Should the question be, you know, what bridges need to be built so that people feel um, trust, um, not even trust, trust to, you know, engage in an activity, in that case, the vaccine, but trust to engage in a conversation to be able to ask the questions. Um, so I, I think, I don't know if that, I think in some ways that um, brings me a little bit, makes me a bit more optimistic and pessimistic that this isn't a <laughs> genetics or genomics issue, that this is really a healthcare and, so, and societal issue. Um, you know, uh, Lisa, you, you, you had so many great examples, um, I should say clear examples of, you know, the connection between racism and the impa impact on um, a family's access and willingness to receive um, genetic services. I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more to that in terms of, you know, is, are the, from your viewpoint and, and the viewpoint of you know, family voices, you know, are we turning a corner in that space? Are there more opportunities coming up or are we still, um, is there still really a long way to go, particularly because of, um, you know, racism, implicit bias, things like that, that are still kind of ingrained in these systems? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, and I think that, you know, I say all the time, we're in a racial reckoning right now right? Like we, we, we see this happening, we see it bubbling up and, and, and we really have to deal with, you know, the impact and the historical nature of racism on every facet of, of what happens across our country. Um, and so with that, and being a person that sits at many tables that are, you know, the, the number one hot button issue right now is equity. Um, I, I feel hope, so I'll, I'll say that. Um, I feel hope that is there, that people are, are bringing people of color, particularly Black people, to the table to say, what has been your experience and, and what is it that's happening? But I think we're a long way off. I, I, I don't, I, what I have left to say is not quite as hopeful. I, <laughs> I think we're a long way off. I think we need to get to the how to be and, and people being receptive to the how because it's going to take partnership. It's going to take, you know, real conversations. It's going to take partnering with who do, who, especially in the Black community, who are those people that Black people go to and they trust when, when, when they talk about their health um, healthcare and their medical needs and really partnering with them. But it's, and, and it's going to take wanting to, um, as Shanique was say, invest, you know, from a research standpoint, it's going to take wanting to invest in, um, from a policy standpoint in really getting to the how and, and, and then building that trust. And so, and, and to build that, like we didn't get here overnight, right? And so it's not gonna correct itself overnight. And so I think, I think there's progress being made, but I think we're, I think we're a long ways off. I mean, and, but it took us a long time to get here. So I, I, I'll say I'm, I'm hopeful. Thank you. Um, so, and to add to that, so, um, you know, we're a long way off, but what about, you know, all these uh, different initiatives that have come into place, um, both uh, from an agency perspective or even a, at, um, a federal perspective? You know, we have the National Sickle Cell Anemia Control Act. We ha we've had GINA for a really long time. That's the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. You know, we have a range of different diversity and inclusion initiatives, you know, to the point where people are saying, should we be even using those phrases anymore? Um, you know, even to, 
you could say more recently, the, the efforts of NIH through their All of Us program, um, um, I shouldn't call it a program, you know, really initiative that has many different um, layers to it. So even with all of that, you know, are, are those, um, do we think in those instances, I know I listed a lot of things there, but is that a, um, is that feeding into more of like actually doing the work, not just identifying it or doing the work, or are some of these issues, are some of these um, instances still just at the identification point? You know, um, you know, I open the stage to both of you for your comments and perspectives on that. Yeah, um, well, I, I'd be happy to share, and then certainly um, Shaniqua. So, policies and initiatives and seeing that change happen is great, and it's it's progress, and it's it's tremendous. However, policies and initiatives, from my vantage point, don't equate to behavior change. And so a lot of times you see the same people, right, that are in the same positions that are, um, you know, implementing some of these initiatives. And, and so, again, you get back to some of those core beliefs and, and implicit bias and things like that that can creep in to how we... Um, implement a, a policy or implement an initiative. Um, and so I'm not saying that, I mean, I, I think the policy change and the initiatives are step one, but I think that there has to be accountability for initiative, you know, uh, um, implementing some of these policies and initiatives with fidelity and the way that they're supposed to be so that um, we see the change in the behavior come with the change in the policy. Um, thank you for that. You know, I think the law is powerful and it can be a deterrent. It can provide incentives. Unfortunately, historically, especially when it comes to research abuse, the law has been reactive. And so the law has to work in conjunction with education and changing the culture and also addressing more than genetics. I think with some of the acts that you described, there's a level of genetic exceptionalism. That's especially true with the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA. There are other factors that can suggest that a person has a genetic condition or might uh, fall ill in the future. And um, it's unclear how well GINA can truly protect a person from genetic discrimination. We also know that the law only covers health insurers and employers. And so others have argued that a non-discrimination health law should be more uh, comprehensive and actually go beyond genetics. There's misinformation. The Sickle Cell Act that you mentioned was passed as a way to um, advance justice and increase funding for research on sickle cell disease, but people misinterpreted the difference between sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. They began to um, describe sickle cell as in a black disease. We know that people with African ancestry are disproportionately affected by sickle cell trait and disease, but they're not the only group to have it, um, have sickle cell in the population. And so there's misinformation there's also a desire among Americans, given the power structures that exist to other people. And so long as we have this desire to place people in the category of other, as long as there's racism, I think um, there will be limits to what the law can accomplish. But I'm not giving up the law. I think it's important and it should work in conjunction with other important factors. Great, thank you. Um, I will continue to try to weave in some of the questions that have come into the audience, so I feel like we could um, have this discussion for another two hours. Um, one thing I want to get down to that's actually very specific, um, and though this question came up um, within the context of the clinical setting, I think it I think it would be interesting to discuss um, not just in that setting is you know we I think the discussion goes back and forth sometimes around should we even be asking about about race um, when we're doing intakes, and what, uh, whether that's an assessment, doing a family uh, history um, for a genetic counseling session or in research. Should we be asking about ethnicity? Should we be asking about ancestry? Should we be asking about both? 
And then to me, the question is always, well, what are you asking? Why do you want to know? And, you know, what do we get out of that? Um, so I kind of want to throw that to the panel in terms of what your thoughts are around, um, you know, asking these questions about race, ethnicity, ancestry, all of that. Um, you know, when is it appropriate? Um, what makes it appropriate or inappropriate? Um, and, and just your, your perspectives on that. Sure, I can go first. You mentioned precision medicine in your last question, and I didn't, uh, I didn't remember to comment on it, the All of Us initiative, but there are also other precision medicine initiatives. And the goal of precision medicine is to look at different types of data. The uh, researcher might um, observe your health record for a long period of time, might examine biometric data. Um, uh, many researchers in public health have found that zip code is more determinative of your health outcomes than race. And there are many physicians, many physicians of color, many researchers who believe in race, believe that race is the best we have, and that we should use race and we should ask about race. But um, I'm looking forward to a day when we can go beyond racial categories and sit down with a patient and ask them about their diet dietary preferences, their lifestyle, their culture, where they live, and make diagnoses based on a holistic approach. And, and, and I commend um, all of those engaging in precision medicine who are looking for um, a, a way to collect comprehensive data about people and understand how different factors and variables influence health other than race and other than genetics. And, um, and are um, engaging people in this kind of research so that they can even review their own data and ask these questions. I think that's going to be a step in, uh, in, a, in a better direction. Um, you could ask a person about their parents and their grandparents and their racial and ethnic background. I think that can be informative. Um, however, a lot, a lot of people don't know their ancestry and don't know their genetic ancestry. If Barack Obama came into a doctor's office and the doctor said, please tell me uh, you, you look black, you know, are you black, are you African-American? Barack Obama might say yes. If he said, um, who are your parents? Barack Obama might say, I have a black parent and a white parent. What would that tell us? It wouldn't tell us that his father is from Kenya and that his mother is, uh, I think she's Irish. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. But it wouldn't tell us that perhaps the mutation that we might want to think about are prevalent in East African populations. And so um, these kinds of questions can be limited in terms of the information that they tell us. And just looking at a person's skin color obviously does not tell you their genetic or ancestral background. Thank you for that. Um, Elisa, anything you want to add to that? No, I think she said it well. I, I, I think moving towards a, a much more I think race is one factor, and I think that I, to say it, to, to not include it, I, I, I don't think is the necessary approach, but I think, as Shanique was said, expanding it out to much broader, to really understand, you know, who, who's sitting in front of you, what's their, you know, background, where they come from, learning about their family and their ancestors is going to be the critical piece to, to really getting beyond race and understanding the factors that, that influence their, their genetics. Great. Can I add to that? Yeah. I, I think Serena Williams is a great example of that, Elisa, and her struggles feeling heard as a woman about to give birth as a doctor. Serena Williams has plenty of money, <laughs> fame, and stature. But when we talk about being a Black woman uh, who's in labor, uh, racism, and all of the biases, implicit and explicit, still matter. So yes, does race matter? Absolutely, it still matters. I completely agree. I agree too. It's just pushing the question. <laughs> um, so I know that we are at time, but we have one more question. And as I go through this question, we're going to um, launch another poll, um, again, just to get a better sense of um, the audience um, perspectives and, and thinking of, about our format and so that we can continue to provide these opportunities. But this last question is obviously for the whole panel. 
Um, with all the things that we've discussed, um, you know, what are the opportunities for um, particularly public health programs to um, engage in this discussion and to uh, really reduce these disparities? And so I leave that pretty open. That could be newborn screening programs, that can be, um, you know, public health programs that are looking at um, population genetics, um, whether looking at cancer or other issues. You know, from that perspective, in terms of thinking about our agencies, our um, you know, typically government run and funded agencies that are meant to be uh, providing for all communities, you know, what can they be doing um, around these issues? So to me, um, what, I, what I think is needed is, um, and I think about my time, you know, as a, a block grant reviewer sitting at the tables talking about this with, you know, public health officials that Developing targeted programs, you know, that being very intentional about who you're seeking um, to, you know, to reach out to and to engage. Um, targeted kind of educational programs and outreach programs that, again, as I said earlier, partnering with communities, where do people get their health information? If it's the faith-based communities, if there are community-based organizations that, that are trusted in that community, and it's going to look different every community across the country and really understanding who that is and, and how do I go and partner with them so that people feel comfortable to say, you know what, if my pastor think it's, thinks it's okay, I'm going to show up and I'm going to look. If my, um, if, if a, a local sorority thinks that this is okay and that's what I feel comfortable with, I'm going to show up and I'm going to listen um, in order to just build the education and the knowledge so that families feel more comfortable and begin to build trust um, around genetics. I, I think that that to me is, is that there needs to be intentional education and outreach. And I would add to that um, some things I'd like to see agencies and also corporations do more of is go beyond the pipeline. The pipeline is incredibly important and we do need to invest more in um, our trustworthy leaders and scientists of the future. But um, I was on a call about diversity recently and someone said something very interesting to me. Um, he said, pipelines are less threatening than giving up an actual leadership position or including people on leadership levels. And it, it, it made me think, where are our PhD graduates going? Why aren't they coming to these fields? Why aren't they staying? And um, I, I would love a future when we can have more empirical research invest, and investment in maintaining leadership um, in the sciences and not just the leader of a diversity and inclusion board, although those are important, but also the leading scientists on a grant. So uh, I'd love to just see more investment in how we can um, connect with people who are ready now to lead. Great. I think that is a wonderful place to, um, I will not say end our discussion, but pause it so that we can get back to things. But um, I want to say thank you so much to our panelists for sharing so much information, but also your perspectives. You know, uh, this isn't something that, you know, I'll be honest, isn't distance from us. It's not something that we just study or participate in. It's our lives um, and it's, you know, how we are in the world. And I I, I really appreciate you bringing um, your full self to the, to the discussion. We often say that at Expecting Health in terms of bringing your full self. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. Um, this has been a great discussion, a lot of questions. I know that you both put your contact information in the chat um, so that people can contact you there. Um, we uh, will have this recording available in the next few weeks and we'll let you all know that you'll be, um, as a registrant, you will get um, information about that. Um, and um, we will follow up with more information and resources and next steps. Um, and lastly, I will want to put in a little plug uh, that our National Genetics Education and Family Support Center has recently launched a um, recruitment for a work group on uh, diversity and inclusion, which you can get learn more about um, through emailing anyone who's part of the Expecting Health team. Um, but we're excited about that and as another opportunity to continue continue this uh, discussion. Uh, but with that, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you for the questions in the chat and um, have a great afternoon.
Thank you so much for having me. This was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.